हेलो एवरी वन एंड वेलकम बैक टू माई चैनल आई नो इट्स बीन अ वायल सिंस द लास्ट अपलोड सो आई एम रियली सॉरी फॉर दैट टू कीप यू स्टक ऑन दी अनस्टडी फ्लो सॉल्वर सो इन द पास्ट वीडियो आई गेव यू अ ग्लिम्स ऑफ द मैथडोलॉजी दैट वी आर गोइंग टू यूज फॉर द अनस्टडी फ्लो सोल्यूशन एंड इन द वीडियो टूडे आई क्विकली गिव यू अ रिकैप ऑफ दैट एंड देन आई वॉक यू थ्रू एज टू हाउ टू इम्प्लीमेंट दैट मैथडोलॉजी इन मैट लैब so hopefully in the next few minutes you will be able to learn how to do that so let's get started so i introduced you to what is called as a dual time artificial compressibility method and we said that in this particular method we implement two different kind of time zones one is the physical time in which we wanted to get the solution and another was a pseudo time which was used for the computations accordingly we change the governing equations which is the incompressible continuity equation or the artificial incompressible continuity equation and the momentum equation so we saw that we were using this tau that is the pseudo time step in both the continuity and momentum equation and we had the physical time derivative only in the momentum equation and accordingly we saw how we can discretize that using a forward finite difference method and rest of the terms they were treated as they were so we would be needing two different set of velocities one that corresponds to the physical time and one that corresponds to this pseudo time so most of the time our computations would be in the pseudo time but we would be needing these physical velocities to get that physical velocity derivative so del u by del t term that would be dealt with using these physical velocities while everything else the convection term the diffusion term and the other velocity derivative they would be handled using the pseudo time so we saw that the physical time term can be written as u n plus 1 minus u at n divided by dt and other terms they were they were using an index of q which means the pseudo time index and everything else such as the continuity equation they were all using the pseudo time variables so hopefully once you settle this then we can start looking at the code and while i walk you through the code i hope that you keep this in mind so that the things would be more clear to you if in any case the code looks confusing go back here and again look at how the indexing is being done and in case if you feel any problem you can join the telegram group where i try to address all the queries or you can put your question in the comment as well so let's look at how the coding would be done so like always we start the code with the three clear all close all and the clean the command window commands so that we start our workspace as a fresh workspace after that if you remember from the lid driven cavity tutorials we define what are the number of points what are the domain lengths and accordingly we can define the grid spacing and based on that we can define the domain span in both x and y direction and for this particular problem i would be demonstrating using a reynolds number of 100 and the values of dt which is the physical time advancement or the physical time step and the dual time step or the pseudo time step tau has been defined here so you can play around with these values generally they will determine whether your solution would be stable or not and if it's stable they can also determine whether your solution converges faster or not so the first idea is to get the solution stable then the idea would to get the accelerated solution so this is something that is not uh, in the scope of this course our idea is only to get the stable solution so we'll keep these dt and d tau small enough for that particular value of reynolds number and after that i have keeping the artificial compressibility as 10 and because this is an unsteady flow problem so rather than the lid driven cavity where the lid was moving in one direction with a constant velocity in this case we would be considering the case of an oscillating lid driven cavity what that means is the motion of the lid is harmonic or in this case it would be a sinusoidal motion so we can consider anything of the form as a cos omega t where the frequency would determine how fast Uh, would the lid be moving back and forth so we are taking a omega or the angular velocity of pi by 6 we say that the initial time value is 0 and the final time until which we want the solution is 
2 pi by omega. So you can change these parameters as per your problems, but the idea here is to give you an overview of how the code would be written. So the final time corresponds to the physical time or the physical final time until which we want to run the simulations for. Then the question comes as to how we can initialize the variables. So you look at uh, the different kind of variables that I'm using here. The first one is the u, v and p at the unsteady case. So what these variable means is because this is an unsteady flow solver. So we want to store that transient or that unsteady flow data at multiple time steps. So these variables, these u unsteady, v unsteady and p unsteady are going to be that information that contains all the time step for both u, v and p variables. So this is like the gold mine of your data. So this is why we have simply initiated them as zero and one. Regard, uh, rather than giving them a matrix size because we don't really know as to what would be the size of this matrix because the number of time steps could vary depending on simulation to simulation that is why guessing how many time steps would be there for the simulation is hard to guess and therefore we just initialize them as either 0 or 1 and subsequently during the code we would be changing their values. The staggered variables are very similar to what we were using in the case of a steady flow. So we had u and u nu and mind you that these variables here, they correspond to the pseudo time or the q variables that the uh, superscript of q and corresponding to the physical case or the nth and n plus one superscripts, we have these u physical old and v physical old and Remember that the time derivative term, it needs n plus one and n or n or n minus one. So this old uh, time step values, they are represented by this u and v physical old. And since the physical time information is only required for the momentum equation, that is why we are not defining anything that is called as p physical old or the pressure physical old time step. Now let us look at how to solve this particular problem. So I'm defining a solution index of one that I would be using to handle these unsteady data. So we, we are going to store our unsteady data or the transient data in these u, v and p variables or the unsteady u, v, p variables. So corresponding to that, I would be needing this solution index that would be dealing with the time value. So for every time step, I would be storing the data somewhere. So this solution index would keep a track of the time index. Correspondingly, in the iterations, we start with zero. And this is the error required as always that we want to the error goes to 10 to the power of minus six. So this corresponds to the continuity residual here. And we say that while the time value is less than the final time, because this is the case of an unsteady flow and we don't really know whether there would be a steady state within our final time or not. So rather than putting a loop on something else, we say that while the computation time or while the computational physical time is less than the final time that we want to go for, keep running the simulations because we don't really know what would be the time required for the steady observation. So I put a line here that displays what time it is solving for. So this is the command that would give me an idea of where we are in this unsteady solution process. Then I define an error of one after which we are going to do this pseudo time step process. So for every physical time, we have this pseudo time solver. So the first while loop, it takes care of the every time step part or the every physical time step part. And the next loop here, it would take care of the pseudo time step part. So I say that while the error is greater than 10 to the power minus six, which is what we want the error residual for, then we start solving the equations. So these equations are going to be solved in the pseudo time, mind you. So the X momentum equation, just like for any other staggered grid, they have some I and J index and we have the pressure diffusion advection terms and they are exactly the same as we were using in the steady flow solver. There is another addition that makes the difference is this unsteady part. And if you remember the unsteady part is simply the time derivative and that is why I am defining it simply as U at I comma J minus u physical old divided by dt. 
So what I'm doing here is that rather than writing u n plus 1 minus u n divided by t or dt, I'm writing u at q plus 1 minus u n divided by delta t. So rather than enforcing the unsteady term as a source or as a constant value for the entire pseudo time step calculation, I am using that new value of the pseudo time to use this unsteady flow problem. You can try this in a different ways and depending on how you use it, you might observe that your solution may go faster or slower or sometimes if you treat it very badly, it may diverge. So in this case, I'm defining it in this particular way. So this might be slightly different from what I did it in notes in the last video. And after defining all these terms, I simply write the u nu at the i comma j point. So this is again similarly written to what we were doing in the steady flow solvers. After that, I implement the boundary condition and there is a very small change here because the lid is now moving oscillate in an oscillatory motion. So rather than a fixed top velocity, I have to change the boundary velocity according to the boundary condition. So in this case, this is going to be cos of omega t. So if you remember from the staggered grade arrangement, we have to multiply it by 2 because the physical domain was lying in between the staggered grid points. Similarly, I solve for the y momentum equation and again here for the unsteady case, I use this v at i comma j. So v at i comma j is equivalent to the v velocity at q plus 1 pseudo time step and v physical old is v at nth physical time step. And we use this unsteady term and accordingly we calculate the new value of v at i comma j in the computation, pseudo computational time. So this is how we are going to solve for the v velocity. And similarly, we put the boundary conditions for v. They are exactly the same as the steady counterpart. So once we get the momentum equations figured out, then we solve for the continuity equation. So if I go quickly give you a look here, the continuity equation would carry a multiplication of delta with tau and that is what we are putting it here that p nu at i comma j is p i j minus delta times tau and the continu uh, continuity equation residual which is nothing but the divergence of velocity if you look closely. After this we implement the boundary conditions and after that we calculate the error residual. So I'm not stressing this part on it because this has already been taken care of twice in the steady flow solvers. And once the computation finish, I assign the u as u nu, v as v nu and p as p nu. And we change the iterations to be iterations plus one. So this is still going in the pseudo time step. So remember, while the physical time step is not reached the final physical time, we do the computations in the pseudo time. So the pseudo time would keep going on until the error is required less than the required error which was some 10 to the power of minus 6. So the computations would now keep going in the pseudo time. So I'll show you very quickly as to how that would be happening. So once the computations are finished in the pseudo time, so look here that once I hover over the this end, this corresponds to the while loop that was corresponding to the pseudo time loop. So once I reach a steady solution in the pseudo time, what I do is I assign the old physical time step variable to be the new physical time variables. So what that means is I assign the u physical old as the u new and v physical old to be the v new. And this would happen or this would impact what these unsteady terms we calculate. So after we calculate the steady solution in the pseudo time, we assign those variables at the old variables for the physical time. I know this might be a little bit confusing, but if you draw these time levels here, so remember that we had n and n plus 1 here, and we had these a lot of q levels here. So the final solution of this q level, this would correspond to the nth uh, physical time step here. And similarly, after we get the solution for every time step figured out, we store that variable or we store that data in a particular these use unsteady, v unsteady and p unsteady variables. 
so remember that we were using these variables to store all the transient data and that is why i had this uh, i had assigned a solution index to store that so this is going to be a 3d matrix the first index would correspond to the time and the second and the third index they corresponds to i and j direction so this would contain all the information about the flow variables at every time step for the entire domain so i i'm going to store all the data in here and once that is done i assign the solution index to increase by 1 so if i run this code part by part so if i run the first part then the second part so what happens there is that i have initialized all the variables my omega has been initialized and my final time has been 12 seconds so once i initialize the variables here which is again very similar to what the study part was that for a case of 100 by 100 grid the staggered grid arrangement would be slightly up or down and if i start this particular section which solves my governing equation what would happen is i would see a line that would tell me at what time step what physical time step we are solving it and for every physical time step the computations would be carrying out in the pseudo time step so right now they are solution is being calculated for 0.1 second and this process would go on until you get that first while loop satisfied that is while the time the present time or the time underscore well variable it's less than the final time until which we want the solution so this might take a while depending on the speed of your computer the grid size the dt and d tau and so i'm just going to fast forward it to until i get that unsteady flow solutions figured out so that i can give you a glimpse of how the flow solution actually looks and how you can visualize it in some sense so now i have gotten the solution and you can see that these unsteady u unsteady variables they are a 3d matrix that corresponds to 240 index in the first place that corresponds to time and 101 by 101 was my grid size one of the ways in which you can visualize the solution is to use the same contour plot so what i'm doing here is that i want to plot my solution after every 20 time steps for all the uh, u and v variables so what i do is i start a figure command that would start my give me a new figure and what i do is i create a new for loop that corresponds to the first variable being 20 the spacing being 20 and the final variable being 100 so in this way the i would vary nine times so i create a subplot of 3 by 3 and i use this command of count to keep the track of those subplots so i'll share this code with you and you can try and see how this count will take care of all the subplots and then what i do is i take a slice of that u unsteady matrix depending on this i variable so when suppose if the i is 20 so the u unsteady 20 comma colon comma colon so it would be trying to get the 2d matrix or the 2d spatial data at the 20th time step and then i have to reshape this matrix because this u sample initially it would be something like 1 times 100 1 times 101 and we have to create or convert it to simply 101 by 101 we have to remove that one at the start so we can use this reshape command to take care of that if you don't understand what i'm saying just give it a try and it would make it much more clear and after that i create a mesh grid to be able to plot a contour after which i simply plot the contour and give some color maps and the label so if i hit control and enter here i expect to get a plot that contains a 3 by 3 matrix of u velocity contours so if i uh, maximize it we can see that initially the v velocity u velocity is in the positive x direction as indicated by this red color that corresponds to plus 1 so it means it is going this way and after that at some point we initially expect that the lid would be going back and forth so at some point the velocity would be zero followed by a negative velocity which you can see in the third and the fourth contour that the velocities are very close to zero and finally the velocities are going to be negative followed by zero so a 
qualitative way is to look at the contours. If you want to be more quantitative, you can take a line in the center and then plot the velocity along the line. You will see that the top velocity would be changing from plus one to minus one with the angular frequency that you have provided. So you can use this idea in other flow problems as well. Accordingly, you might have to change the boundary conditions, but the algorithm would remain more or less the same. So I hope that this video would help you understand how to implement a unsteady flow solver using MATLAB, which was based on artificial compressibility method. If this video was helpful to you, please like this video and consider the subscribe option so that you can stay connected to all the videos that I might be uploading in the future. And in the case of any questions, as I suggested earlier, you can put them down in the comments or you can join the telegram group, the link of which is in the description and you can ask them there. So I'll see you next time. Until then, take care and bye bye.